Good evening. The meeting is now called to order. This is the Education, Youth, and Family Services Committee meeting for Wednesday, March 8, 2023. I'm the chair, Council Member Albert Mills at large. At this time, I will call a roll for those members of the committee first. Councilwoman Letitia Bracey, Vice Chair. Present. Councilwoman Sinead Darby. Councilwoman Brigida Fields. Present. Councilwoman Xanthia Oliver. Council President Trippy Congo. Here. Are there any other council members that wish to be acknowledged at this time? Thank you. Okay. We will proceed to the agenda items. Today we are fortunate enough to have an update from the Wilmington Learning Collaborative with Mr. Donald Patton. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. So will the PowerPoint be brought up, please? <clears throat> please state your name and your title, please. Yes, my name is Donald Patton. I am on a member of the Christina School District Board and also um, a member of the Wilmington Learning Collaborative Council uh, a Recommended by the mayor and approved by city council. Thank you, sir. So in other words, I'm your representative on Wilmington City Council. So if I, if I may? Yes, sir, please. <clears throat> so the purpose for me this evening is to uh, give an update to the Wilmington City Council um, Youth and Family Services Committee uh, on the work that the Wilmington Learning Collaborative is doing to date. Next slide, please. And this the slide that's up right now, uh, that's a picture of all of the uh, members of the Wilmington Learning Collaborative uh, that took a trip to Fort Worth, Texas about two weeks ago. Uh, the purpose was to, uh, we had, in November we had gone, which is a part of the presentation, we had gone up to Massachusetts to see the Springfields a model of uh, empowerment zone schools uh, and so <clears throat> at that point they didn't offer a elementary com uh, component they only had mil a secondary middle school and high school uh, Texas has elementary so we ventured to Texas to make sure that we could see the system from K to 12 next, next slide please So in the front of you uh, is a uh, list of all the members of the uh, Wilmington Learning Collaborative. Uh, Reverend Perry, who is the chair, is also the uh, city member to the Brandywine School District School Board. The other uh, person that doesn't have their other affiliation would be the uh, acting secretary, Ms. Yell. She is uh, actually the parent for Red Clay School District and all the other uh, members are as indicated. The last three are students from, uh, one student from each of the three uh, school districts that are represented in the collaborative. The senior for the three districts would be the only member who can vote. The other members are nine voting members. And it's a rotation so that uh, every district gets to represent uh, their student represent the uh, council and vote, uh, but the other two will just be uh, members um, and be able to share with the senior any things that they want voted or any way that they would like to have their voice. Next slide, please. So this slide represents the Brandywine School District. Um, their liaison is Ms. Lavina uh, Jones Davis. Uh, and the school that is in the collaborative is Harlan Elementary School. Clearly, they only have one school. The next district is Christina School District, and their liaison is Paul Dumford, and the schools involved in the collaborative would be Byard, Bancroft, and Stubbs Early Education Center. And then Red Clay, which has the most schools, which is represented, their liaison is Ms. Susan Hoffman, and they have Lewis, the dual uh, language school, Joseph Johnson, which previously was Highland School, uh, Shortleach Early Education Center, and Warner School. Next slide, please. 
So I just put these dates up just so that you can have a reference. Um, the Wilmington Learning Collaborative officially was established by the MOU signing uh, on November the 1st of last year. Uh, the 12 member council, um, from the time that the uh, MOU was signed and until uh, 126 uh, of this year, there were only six members, and those members were the three superintendents and the three city school board members. So they didn't have a quorum, so that there wasn't a lot that they could do uh, between that date and the date that the council uh, was officially up and running. Uh, council approved a project manager uh, contract at our, our last meeting, which was 2-23. Um, and also uh, during that meeting, <clears throat> um, we had the presentations from TNTP and Dell State, which uh, initially in power was operating independently and Dell State were op was also operating independently. Um, at some point, they had a discussion to try to give us the best model we could in terms of representation for an experienced project manager. And so on 223, which was our last meeting, the board also uh, voted to approve the contract for the project manager and chose DSU in the collaboration with the Empowerment Zone. Next slide, please. So just, and I'll try to go through this quickly. Uh, you can see for yourself, but uh, what I did was on my visits is to outline the strengths, any concerns that we would have implementing the policy or the, the program that that particular site had. And then I, I built what I consider to be the strengths for success for our students here in the city of Wilmington if we were uh, going to implement any parts of the model from the empowerment zone or the complete model. There are some, there are some real clear differences. For instance, in Springfield, um, the state took over those schools or was about to take over those schools. And so what uh, the empowerment zone uh, did was said, let us run them, um, give us the money. So they get 3% every year of the standing budget for Springfield School District. So the, the district will set aside 3%. They run, the, they run their empowerment zone independent, complete autonomy. Um, they do have a board, <clears throat> and that board is a, the uh, mayor is a part of it, and also the superintendent of the school district in Springfield is a part of that. <clears throat> so they do have input in, uh, but this, the zone is run completely independent. So. I'll just read them. Uh, the, the strengths were their accountability system, the autonomy that they give the leaders in the schools to run the schools. There there's, has to be a trust factor built and relationships and partnerships to make that model or any other model actually work. And you will we'll be able to see at the end when my assessment of the uh, empowerment zone, those things would work for us and, and why. But the, <clears throat> my concerns were they weren't really fully up and operating with the, I think, which was one of the top three components that we need to be successful, which is the family engagement piece. And when I questioned them in detail, they finally admitted that that was something that they really needed to work on because as they were describing it, I didn't see that being what I would want it to be for us, for it to work. Uh, pay equity and the union would, would be a, a big concern for us because <clears throat> Our unions have to agree and they have to sign an MOU and uh, when you start talking about paying one group of folks more than the others, that usually becomes a, a problem. So uh, here, for instance, under the MOU, we do a stipend. Um, so it's not the same and it's a set amount, but that's uh, what you have to negotiate and I'm not sure what we would be able to negotiate. So that's a major concern. Um, the other thing that they did in that model is because there was autonomy, you didn't have to accept the services of the current school district. So you could go out and buy your own services. And one example that was presented was um, custodial services. So the uh, <clears throat> leaders of the empowerment zone uh, spoke with the principal of the school who knew a company that they would rather work with. So they were able to hire that company for their custodial staff as opposed to use the custodial staff from the district. 
So they, they had that flexibility. If their uh, curriculum, for instance, if there was a curriculum that they wanted that was not the curriculum that was being used by the district, they could go out and purchase their own curriculum. They didn't have to use the district curriculum. So that 3% that they were given was for them to work independently. There were no strings attached to it, and there, there was no one saying, you can do this or you can't do this, other than the principal, the staff, and the families. So that's the autonomy piece that I think it would be meaningful for us. And then the district's willingness to step back. That's huge. <clears throat> we don't operate that way. We operate that our superintendents, our school boards, they run the schools, whether some people want to admit to that or not. That's, we, we operate from top down, not from bottom up. Mm -hmm. And so t uh, for me, when I went over and looked at the, the strategies for success, if we were to implement any parts of this model here, and again, remember, the model there was mandated. They, they didn't have an option. They were either going to be taken over or they had to come up with something that the state uh, would agree would su supplant them taking over physically <clears throat> and financially. So for it to work here in the city of Wilmington, in, in my best professional expertise, you have to have smaller class sizes. You're, you're not going to get away from that and, and be successful. Um, <clears throat> you have to have full autonomy. So this, this should be a bottom-up model not a top down. So the school, the parents, and the teachers should be the ones who actually make the decisions for their school, independent of the district or the school board. And in this case, it would be the council. Um, professional development has to be, um, <clears throat> you have to decide on what are the things, for instance, I'll give you an example. There are some things that I think work really well for schools, culturally relevant teaching. If we don't teach our teachers how to teach the students that they're teaching, that, that's a struggle. If we don't uh, use, um, my guy, I went blank for a minute. If we don't have uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me for a minute, uh, restorative practice. I lost it. If we don't have restorative practice in our schools where um, what we do is, Right now, we are more geared toward, we, we won't say this, but we're more geared towards punishment. And we, we have to be more geared towards restoring kids. So restorative practice is, is another model that I think has to be a part of the educational landscape of the Wilmington Learning Collaborative if we're going to be successful with our students. Uh, the, the biggest piece is the family engagement. And this, this is going to require a lot of work. I'm looking at the two models that are in existence that are working, but that component is a component that they have to work at, and so would we, because it's not easy to get families involved. But I think that uh, if we hired family liaisons or we worked with individuals who actually um, work with parents, advocates for parents, uh, know the community, I think we have a better shot at making that work here better than it is in the two models that I had a chance to visit. Um, key partnerships. I, I think we have to develop partnerships with our community. We have to get grants. We have to do other things other than the funding source and the uh, supports that we have and resources that we have currently. So I think the key uh, partnership is a big piece. And then the continuous cycle of improvement. So that's uh, inspecting what you expect. So we are monitoring, progress monitoring all the time uh, what the, the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. I have a question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Patton, when you say smaller classes, how, how would that be achievable? So <clears throat> it's done in both of the models that we looked at, mm. and there, there's a price tag to that. Yeah. I, I happen to have been uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 8.30 uh, to 5 uh, working with uh, AIR, uh, American Institute for Research. The state has hired them to do uh, a study to try to figure out what the real cost of a successful school would look like. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we did was went back and looked at the models uh, in the state currently and how we would make adjustments to those. And one of the adjustments in almost all cases was we need more teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know that's a really challenge right now to have uh, to find good qualified teachers. Um, but we need to find a way to fund 
smaller class sizes because as long as we continue with the same model, we're mm -hmm. going to get the same results, which is our kids are we're failing our kids. Mm -hmm. So the school districts right now, I think, would have to make it a priority. Um, I think that with the monies that we we would be getting from uh, the state for the Women to Learning Collaborative. Um, the executive director could look at that and make a determination, he or she, as to what's the best way of achieving smaller class sizes. Um, but we, we do need smaller class sizes. One of the things that was uh, clear to me in both of the visits that we made was there were small class sizes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And you'll see a picture of, of a couple of the situations, and you'll see the size of the class. And that was the size of the class on a normal basis okay. so just to follow up Mr. Yes, Chair, do we already know what that price tag would be here locally so we we have some guesstimates and we're not mm -hmm. allowed to share those because of okay. the study um, but we have some guesstimates of what the difference would be in terms of uh, staffing schools with the appropriate uh, teachers support staff uh, materials resources uh, safety was mm -hmm. a, a consideration that was placed into the equation so there there is a number I will tell you this, um, I have the numbers for two states, the two that we visited. Mm -hmm. uh, one is $23,000, uh, I can give you the exact number, but it's a, a, around $23,000. The other one is mind boggling, because I'm not sure it's accurate, but it was $9,900 per student in Texas. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how they are, because Right now, our number in the state of Delaware is 17,000. Mm -hmm. So you take that 17,000, you have to take off some things like uh, transportation, operations, facility, and it now comes down to about 14,000 actually spent in the classroom on students. So those numbers are very okay. different. The numbers that we came up with, uh, we actually, this workshop that we had for three days, we actually plugged in what we felt based on experience of all the people in the room, uh, schools would need to get to small class sizes to have the right uh, re resources and supports that they need and the security that they need in our schools. Okay, thank you. Thank next you, slide. Yeah, if I could follow before we go to the next, uh, I have a few questions as well. Sure. All right. One, what's the ideal class size we're, we're thinking of? So it depends. Um, and if you look at how we're funded, we're funded on like for students who are our highest need students, special ed students, I'll give you those three mm -hmm. classifications. Um, one to three, mm -hmm. and then around six, and then 10. So there's what we call settings or classifications. I'll do the settings because you're probably more familiar with that. A regular classroom, that's a student with an IEP in a regular classroom, um, with what we call a setting. Mm -hmm. So in that setting, you can have a, um, you, you hire one teacher for 10 students. We go to the next setting, which is a B setting, which would have two teachers potentially in the classroom, either teaching in that classroom or pulling students out in that classroom. Uh, and that's a B setting. And in that B setting classroom, uh, it would be uh, one to six, or okay. one teacher to six students. And then when you go to the highest need students, then that's a C setting. And in the C setting classroom, you would have one to three students per teacher. So in those, those are predicated on law. When you get to the regular ed students, we fund classrooms on one to 20. So that one to 20 ratio also takes in positions that are not, that are not the actual classroom teacher for the content. They take in your art teacher, your gym teacher, your guidance counselors, your deans. They take in all those other positions. So now that one to 20 can balloon to 30. So you have some classrooms in our state that have 30 students per class in those classes. So we, we want to set a cap on, in the work that we were doing, we want to set a cap on that no more in the best situation, mm -hmm. it would be 20 students max. Okay. But when you get down to for instance, right now, K, K, K to 3, there's a cap of 22. Now, you can ask for a waiver on that cap, but the cap is 22. We think that's high. We would like to see that number move 
to something lower than that. And I don't want to be too specific because I don't want to get too far ahead of the work mm -hmm. that AIR is doing. Yeah. But we think that that number is lower. We think the, the number in middle school is lower. So if you were to ask me what I think personally is a good number, I, I think somewhere around 14 and 15, and that's what you're going to see okay. in both of these districts, the class sizes are around 14 and 15 students. Okay. And that's, that's maxed out at that number. Okay, perfect. And where is the WLC in reference to restorative practices? So <clears throat> remember, we're the council. We're not the um, executive director. So the executive director is going to be hired, and that person will make the decisions on those things, that, which I'll say for laymen, best practices that you would want in, in a school. And so um, it would be, I think, irresponsible for us to say to that person, this is what you have to do. I think it would be responsible for us to say, we know that these are things that we need. We would recommend that these are things that you would consider as a part of this model. Um, but if we hire someone, we're, we should be hiring that person based on their ability, previous demonstrated ability to turn a school around. So they're a transformational leader, not a transactional leader. And if that's the case, then some of these practices they're going to come with because they're not practices that we created. They're practice, best practices across the educational landscape. And number two, do we know what the number is for the three percent that you spoke of for the other? It state? depends on what their budget is. Okay. So, so if their budget is ninety-five million dollars. They get thirty-five percent. Uh, they get three percent of the thirty ninety-five million dollars. So, with every year their budget could change, go up, hopefully. Okay. Um, but they was their three percent would stay intact as part of that. Okay. That budget. And, and last question in reference to uh, family engagement. Do we know what type of areas were creating the barriers for um, Springfield? Oh, I, I don't know that there were areas that, because we didn't dig that deep. I just noticed that when we talk, so for instance, when, when they talked about hiring principals, I didn't see parents okay. as a part of the equation. Um, when they talked about the data, so they had, a, in, in one state, they had a data analysis person attached to each school. So uh, what I didn't see was where they were uh, focused or intentional about including parents in, and, and ensuring that parents were a vital part of the conversation. Okay. So um, I, that pushed me to ask some questions around the family and suspect that the family engagement piece wouldn't be what I would want it to be if we're saying we really want a true, pure model that is going to raise our kids' uh, achievement level and increase the outcomes. Thank you, sir. Next, next slide, please. So this slide is actually on the last school visit that we made to Texas. John uh, White Elementary School was the school that we visited. Uh, we really wanted to uh, have a clear understanding of how uh, the empowerment zone worked for elementary school. So, so that was, we only saw elementary school. But this model was a, a bit different. It wasn't a takeover model. Okay. This model was a collaborative model between a college and a school district. And the college was Wesleyan University, and the school district was Fort Worth Independent School District. So that particular school, <clears throat> now you could play around with semantics and words. I try not to do that. I try to be as straight as I can. Um, that model, that school to me, I would consider a charter school. They don't like charter schools in Texas. So they don't, I don't think, want to use the word charter school, but that school it resembled the charter school to me as close as you could get. But it, it's a collaboration. LAN is the Leadership Academy Network, and that's the network between the district and the college that, that began this work on uh, collaborating together uh, to come up with a, a system that worked for our kids. And so they also, and some of the things will be common, uh, accountability, professional development, um, their coaching staff was superior to anything that I've seen, and actually, I actually uh, talked in the AIR a meeting we had about how we can uh, kind of model that. I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific about it in a minute. But the relationships, the partnerships, they're the same. The pay scale. So in Texas, they start their teachers off at $60,000. If you gain master teacher status, you get an extra $30,000. 
That's as a teacher. I don't know many places in the United States that you can get a master's teacher status. Say I go to college, I get my degree, I get my master's, and then I get I get the, I qualify whatever that process is to be a master teacher. I I come in at ninety thousand dollars. So their pay scale is like really very different than ours and would be a challenge. And then they have uh, a teacher powered practices. And those are the practices that are giving them the results that they're getting and they're uh, research based practices. They're intentional, they're focused, and they're consistent. And so as a result, they, they're getting the results, the favorable results that, that they are in terms of student growth. They use a different measurement to measure growth. They use a measurement that's a, a mix of what, uh, so in Delaware, we do proficiency. So on Smarter Bounds, we measure every student's proficiency. No matter where you start, no matter where you come from, we measure your proficiency. The argument has been made, I made it when I was a principal, that we should be measuring not proficiency, but growth. So when a kid walks into my classroom on the first day, and I do it, we have a universal screener. That's a, where we measure students' progress or skills or ability. Uh, so I measure it on this day. On the last day, that whenever I get that test, there's a year's growth in there. Isn't that progress? Isn't that what we want? So we don't measure that. We measure proficiency. So no matter where a student starts in a classroom with a teacher, we're not measuring if there's any growth there as a we're, we're looking at that more now in our state than we ever have, but in terms of smarter, we don't look at that. In Texas, they look at both. So they measure both. So they're measuring, and some of these schools, and white would be one of them, that really grew, and they have a report card grade on their schools. So A would be the best, a B, a C, a D, E, a F, a G. They were at, the, I think, a G, and I could, could be a little bit wrong about it, but they were at the bottom of the scale and they moved up to a C. But they moved up to a C because of the progress that they made, the, the growth that they showed over the course of that year, <coughs> along with the proficiency piece. So I think that's uh, important to, to note. Um, I, I have never, honestly, as a principal, been in favor of proficiency. Uh, I think it puts our staff in our schools at a real bad dilemma because if you live in a high poverty area or you live in an area with a lot of ELL students, um, your, your scores are going to be lower just naturally. So you come to school and I have a great staff and they're moving kids, but they don't move them in the proficiency model. So we're classified as a failing school when we're really doing a really good job with kids. So I've always been for the growth model. And I think we're moving more towards that, and I think the state recognizes that uh, what Texas did, and they implemented it. Uh, the concerns were the staffing and retention, <clears throat> not there but here, <clears throat> that we would have to be concerned about because of the pay scale and what they did to accommodate uh, the loss of, student, of staff. They raised their pay scale, and so teachers are staying longer. Their, their work conditions are better. Uh, so they, that's a, a big part of it. student mobility. Um, they, they're, they say that they're improving. Um, we would have to worry about that here because we're across uh, districts. Our kids move a lot. And so we would have to uh, figure out some consistency in our instructional approach and in our program approach in our schools. And then uh, the system is short on parent involvement and that, that we we are here currently and we have to do a better job. And I think the Woman to Learning Collaborative putting a parent from each um, school district was huge and good. I think we just have to figure out how to get even more parents involved in the process. Um, some years ago I applied for and received a job in Charleston, South Carolina as a principal of a school called Stahl High School. I'm just throwing that out for conversation. I eventually was convinced to stay here and didn't go. But one of the things that impressed me the most about that, that I hope we can see and feel and, and implement, was they had a parent council. And we're talking about parent councils in the Women to Learning Collaborative. But their parent council was actually the second layer of interviews. So you interviewed at the school with the school personnel, 
and then the second layer was with this parent council. So if you were going to get a principal for a school, parents had a real say in it. They had ownership in it. And then you left there, and then you went to the superintendent or the next level in, in the system. And there it was a, a total of four levels you had to go through. So I hope that we utilize our parent councils, and that's why I keep talking about parent and parent involvement, because I think there are a lot of ways that we can get our parents connected to the educational system. But if, if we keep hiring principals and they, are not, they don't have a say in it, they don't have ownership in it. So if, if we're hiring principals, then parents should not be one parent, and we say we have parents. We ought to have parents from the communities where we're hiring those principals who have a vital say because they have ownership in it and who that principal is going to be. Um, and then, uh, again, it's kind of the basic thing, smallest class sizes. The key to me, and you see me say, you see uh, full autonomy. That, that's huge. We have to give the principals the ability to make the decisions in their schools with their teachers and with their parents. If we don't do that, then we're back to where we always were. So are we talking about change? We have to mean real change. So in the Women to Learning Collaborative, I'm hoping that the superintendents, I'm hoping that the school boards understand that when we hire the executive director, we're giving that person the ability to be able to support those schools. When we hire principals, we're hiring principals with the full understanding that they have the skills, the capabilities to operate those schools with their teachers, with their parents, successfully, because they know what they need and what's best in those schools. And we, we're not telling them what they, we're not telling them what the curriculum should be. We're not telling them what resources they should have or should not have. Maybe some schools need restorative practice. Maybe other schools have already had it, so they don't need it. So they don't, they don't need that. So we have to think in terms of what does that site need, not what do we think that site needs. The uh, force, uh, a focused professional development. So that is that we're, some of the programs that I, I mentioned, we make sure that they have those, but we also make sure that teachers have what they need to grow. So that's the focus part of it. So we want students to get better. They're not going to get better unless teachers get better. Um, so we need to make sure that the money is spent there appropriately. School leadership with accountability. Um, right now, I've argued, and some people are mad at me because of it, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. Uh, our principal is not effective right now. There's a difference. They would be good principals in the right setting. There, there's a difference between um, urban schools and suburban schools, schools with high poverty, schools with high ELL populations. There's a big difference in the leadership skills that you need to do that. And so if we don't have those transformational leaders in our schools, our schools are not going to get better. That's got to be a big part of the discussion. It, whether people get mad or not, that's got to be a big part of the discussion. I like you. But this is not the right setting for you, so we need to shift. We don't need to fire people. We need to shift them over here where they can excel because they have the same issues that students have, that teachers have. They have feelings also. They, they want to be a part of a winning team. They want to be successful. They don't want to be in schools continuously failing and people looking and saying, oh, single-digit growth, single-digit proficiency. They, they want that too. So we should give them that. So we should put them in winning situations. And I'm not sure we've done a good job of doing that. Family involvement, key partnerships, again. The, the other thing here to me is the data analysis person. That person is a person that is working with the instructional coaches, the master teachers, those people at that level, to break down the data from testing with their teachers, with the, uh, the analysis, with the instructional coaches, they go to the teachers and break it down with the teachers so that we're making meaningful changes in classrooms. Because if we're just making changes by the seat of our pants, that's not going to be effective. We need to make data decisions. So based on the data, what do we need to do to help students grow? If we're not looking at data on a regular basis and we only look at at the end when we get smarter balanced data and say, oh, well, we failed X amount of kids. We should be looking at that ongoing formative assessments and summative assessments are important to our discussions with teachers ongoing and not at the end of the school year. And then um, one of the things that we're, we have now in our district and in our state is the teacher, the teacher residency piece. I think that's huge, and I think that will help us uh, get more teachers 
from our communities, train them properly, and then keep them in our, in our districts. Next slide, please. What's the starting salary in Delaware for teachers? I really honestly don't know. Sure. There's different scales, so there's okay. not a set scale. So there's two factors in the salary um, for teachers in Delaware, but I can just assure you it's not 60000 It's probably closer to 40 some thousand range. Okay. Um, but there's two factors. There's the uh, local portion, and then there's the state portion. State is, is generally responsible for 70% of a salary, and then the mm -hmm. local portion is the 30%. Okay. So you'll see two different pay scales or, or salary scales. You'll see a salary scale that is state, and then you'll see one that's uh, district. Each district has a different. For instance, we worked recently in the last year or so, our superintendent worked to increase transportation salary because high demand, very few people. So, so they increased that to match uh, other local districts or the surrounding states. So that's what they do uh, periodically. They'll look at what are the uh, surrounding states paying teachers, what are um, other districts in the state paying teachers, and they may say we need to up our local side. You're not going to up the state side. The state's mm -hmm. going to do that when they see it's appropriate. But you can up the local side to give pay increases to keep teachers mm -hmm. uh, in your district. Okay, just one more. Yes. Around um, teach the, the principal having full autonomy around the curriculum, you, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, the curriculum around what classes should be um, taught, what classes shouldn't be taught. What are the conversations around, like what classes that's still not, are relevant? Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I, oh, okay. If I have said that, I probably okay, apologize. I like I'm not saying what classes they can teach. Mm -hmm. I am saying curriculums, because they're different. There, there are curriculums that have, for instance, uh, culturally relevant materials connected to the curriculum. So that when I mm -hmm. offer it to your student, that's embedded in the curriculum. There are curriculums that don't. Okay. So okay. when I look at the curriculum, I'm looking at a number of things. I'm looking at I've researched the success that that ha curriculum has had with school districts that look like my students. Mm -hmm. I look at does it have an alignment with what kids are expected to do on the performance part of the test, the state test. I look at... Um, what are the specific things in that curriculum that are there or are not there that we need? And then educators, like these instructional coaches, uh, the, in our district we have a teaching and learning department, so folks from the teaching and learning department, they would sit down and have those discussions and say, well, this school had this population of students. It's an urban school. They did over two years or three years or five years. They grew substantially using this curriculum. So let's look at this okay. curriculum. The wise way to do that would be the pilot of curriculum. So the principal and his staff would agree on the curriculum. They would agree on a pilot, which we'll say, while we're running this curriculum, we're running this curriculum with this cohort of students, and then we do a study to determine whether or not this worked better or, or it has a better chance of helping our kids move the needle than the other one. And so that's what I mean okay. when I say the school should have the ability to determine and decide what is the curriculum okay. in math, or what is the curriculum in ELA that is going to serve the best purpose for their students? Okay. All right. Thank you. So this is just a picture. Uh, at th these were on the walls or in the classrooms of, of students. One of the most important parts, you heard me earlier talk about parents buying into, having ownership of, when kids see their work posted around the building, morale goes up performance goes up if we have the other right things in place. So this school saw the significance of making sure that their student work was posted around the whole building in classrooms and it was it was fantastic to see. So that's just a picture I just wanted you to get a glimpse of uh, some of the work the students were doing and some of the uh, things that were posted around the school. Next slide please. So this is just a layer of support and you can break that down any way you want. The, the bottom line is that we have to hire the right people to do the job. We have to let them do the job. We have to have expectations that we're monitoring and that we're communicating. If, it's, if, it's not, if something's not happened, let's talk, to, let's talk through it. That, that's a part of relationships. And let's figure out 
should we be doing something different? What we can't do is we can't figure it out at the end. We have to figure it out ongoing. And that earlier I talked about the continuous cycle of improvement. Well, that's what we do. That's what that is. So these are just some layers of support that were offered uh, in Texas for their teachers. And when I look at them, uh, they're transferable to us using them uh, and being able to be more successful in doing that. Next slide, please. So here are some key expectations and outcomes. Uh, keep students at the center of decision making. You, you, there's an old saying, uh, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep students at the center of everything that you do. Um, sometimes that's a conflict because teachers are saying, I want this. But I would always say, when teachers would say that to me, tell me how that connects with students. Tell me how that services students. And if that answer wasn't appropriate, then we stayed with what we were doing that included students at the center of whatever that was. So that's important. We have to hire a transformational leader who has demonstrated skills, demonstrated skills. There's a history. Here's, I was at this school. This is where we started. This is where we ended. We can't hire people because I like you. We can't hire people because they've been in the system for a long time. That's not moving the needle. And if we haven't figured this out by now, we're not. We have to hire someone who has that kind of leadership ability, transformational, not transactional, and they have to hire the staff because they get to hire staff. They have to hire the staff that also has that support, that, that background, and, and able to support the schools. Provide autonomy and hold accountable. Create parent councils for each student's school. Each school should have their own parent council, and they should be intimately involved in the decisions of those schools. Now, I will tell you, there are a lot of people who don't want that because they're used to that model over there. And the biggest thing we have a problem with as people is change. So I'm saying we need to change to that model. We need to get away from the model that the decisions are all made at the top. And, and we say we have participation from the bottom with one parent. That, that's not, to me, where I think we want to be or should be in the Wilmington Learning Collaborative. And that's so I will advocate and push for parent councils to be active, not just be in name. Uh, target professional development must, uh, district must increase funding. If we go into the, the district, uh, the state, uh, there's a wallet, they call it, where you can look and see where all the spending for each school is. When we go in to look at that on district levels, I think we have to ask ourselves, um, and I'm not a, a, a budgetary person. I mean, I, I ran our budget, but I'm not a budget person that's going to sit down and say, okay, let's shift this here, let's do this there, unless we sit down and do a comprehensive dive into how we spent our dollars. Like, for instance, uh, I think it was $17 million Christi, uh, Christina School District spent um, in teaching and learning. So how was that $17 million spent? Are there things in there that we can pull out that we can put more money at towards the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, towards those schools who are struggling the most in our districts? Clearly, Brandywine has less of an issue because they have, when I say less, they have less schools. They only have that one. So they would have to find the additional funding for that one school. Uh, we would have to find it for three. Um, and um, for um, Red Clay would have to find it for four. But Red Clay is doing some of these things now in their schools. I wouldn't say they're doing them all, but they're doing some of these things now. And so I think as a whole, we have to figure out for the Women's Learning Council how we can get the districts to, to pony up more money um, along with the additional funding. When you look at the, uh, initially it started with seven million for this year, and then it'll go to 10 million next year. So next year, we kind of get to start off as a council with about 17 uh, million minus what we're spending now for uh, the, we just hired uh, the, the, the uh, Del State and Empower. So we have to pay that. We, we need to get a lawyer. We have to pay for that. We need to do some fundamental um, things that we have to do to, from the, that build us from the ground up. So you subtract that money out, we're still going to have a nice sum of money to operate with. But that's just one year. After that, we go back down to something less. 
than 17 million because we're combining two years to, for that first full start of the first year. So I think the districts have to also look and the boards have to talk to the districts about looking inwardly to see what additional funding we can provide for our schools to make sure we have smaller class sizes, to make sure that we, um, there, there's a big thing that, that I think we have to consider is, uh, and I heard this all throughout the governor's uh, traveling when he was doing the town halls, um, this is important and people don't see it as important for our kids, it's huge, field trips. We need to expose our kids to other ways of life. We need to give our kids a hopeless hope and we do that by exposing them to things that they've never seen. I took a bus, three bus loads of kids every year to New York, and the conversations that happened on the return trip were unbelievable. So we, we, field trips are huge. Is there money set aside to do that uh, for schools, to do it in a real significant way, not here and there? So that, that would be uh, some of it. Um, transparency, we, we have to be transparent about everything that we do. We have to be transparent. If we're expecting people to uh, support the Wilmington Learning Collaborative, they have to see that they're a part of it and that they have questions, we have to answer their questions. Um, however we spend the money, we've already clearly said we're gonna make sure that's documented and public so the folks can see what that is and how that is and they have questions, ask questions. A meaningful distributive leadership, and we talked about that, and that's the, the principal can't just run the school. The principal has to run the school with his staff. He has to run the school with his parents or her school with the staff and the parents. Um, how will WLC and Reading align? That's a conversation. Uh, we're having a meeting, I think, on the 24th. I want to say the 24th. We're having a meeting to have that discussion to see how does it align. Um, we don't want to duplicate each other's services to our, to our students and to our schools. So. What's your pathway? What's our pathway? Is there a joint pathway? I mean, those are the discussions that will take place and we'll figure that out uh, between Reading and between the Wilmington Learning Collaborative's uh, membership. And then, um, so I had an opportunity to uh, apply for and was accepted into a program called School Board Partners. It's a national organization out of, Louis, uh, out of uh, New Orleans. New Orleans. And so every Monday from 7 to 8.30, we have training for the month of February and the month of March. And one of the things I learned in one of these trainings brought me to the improved student outcomes. And, and it was real simple. There was a uh, presenter who asked a basic question. I would ask everybody in this room, what are, in, what are school institutions built to do? Improve student outcomes. Improve student outcomes. That's it. That's our main focus. But yet, if you go back, because I did this, I went back and I looked at board meetings after we had this national conversations with people who do this, we never talk about student outcomes. Our main focus is students and their outcomes. And we rarely ever talk about student outcomes in a significant way. And what I'm talking about is, we don't bring data to the school board meetings and say, here's where our students are, and here's how they're performing on the last um, test that they did, the universal screener that they used. This is the results. Here's what we're doing to correct that. Here's the information that we got from Smarter Balance. Break it down, disaggregate it by students, by schools. Let's compare students within the district, students outside the district, students statewide and nationally, so we know where our students really are. We don't do that. But that's our, that's our number one challenge. That's, that's what we're predicated on doing, improving student <coughs> outcomes. But yet, we spend less than 5% of our time in board meetings talking about student outcomes. So that's significant. Next slide, please. So I, I just put some of our priorities. Uh, they're not all inclusive, but hiring an executive director, that's at the top of our list, and we've already started the process. Um, we are now, uh, we have a committee, and that committee is talking to two uh, different recruiting uh, operations or companies. 
um, to see if we need to go that route. We do have people who have applied. We have a, a, the state um, advertised it for us through the state system, but we need to be broader in terms of who we can reach for this. So we're, we're busy working on that. Uh, school, we're setting up a school retreat so that we can uh, onboard all those folks who are part of the uh, Wilmington Learning Collaborative, like the students, parents. They weren't a part of the MOU process, so they don't really understand. They don't know Robert's Rules of Orders, which is what we should operate and are operating under. So they need to understand that. So we're, we're setting up an April retreat, uh, looking, I think we pretty much agreed on a Saturday where we'll all meet and try to go through that. Develop a list of responsibilities for the liaisons. The liaisons are the three people I, earlier in the slide that work for one for each of the three districts, and they're appointed to be the, the contact person between the district and the council. And so we need to figure out, because in, in one case, one of the liaisons is full-time, after June uh, 30th, they'll be full time on the uh, in that job. So what what are they doing? What are we need to make that beneficial to the to the students and to the districts and the council? Engaging in contact, we've already uh, done that. Uh, meet with Reading uh, leadership team, and then create communication networks for the WLC. We we've heard this a couple times at our meetings that we need to have a a, a better uh, voice or a more a uh, succinct, clear voice for the community. So we're looking at ways to be able to come up with how can we effectively communicate with folks so that they, they know what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Next slide, please. Um, uh, our next meeting is this week, it's the 9th, and then the next one will be the 23rd. We meet from 6 to around 7.30ish. We could go more uh, depending upon what the agenda is. Um, in person, you would come to Sarah Pyle, which is a part of the uh, Christina School District uh, program, uh, and it's at 1040 Justice Street in Wilmington, Delaware. If you don't want to uh, physically go, but you want to get on Zoom, that's the Zoom link. Um, and in the future, after uh, March, I think it's beginning April, we're going to work out uh, the, the opportunity to have our um, meetings at the Dell State uh, Riverfront campus, which was formerly Capital One. Okay, Ms. Beck. I'm going to leave that up for one second, if you don't mind. You oh, have yeah, a question? Please. Yes, quick question. So people can get that. As, as the Vice Chair, what do you think the, well, how do you envision the alignment with the Reading? See, I never told you I was the Vice Chair. I did that intentionally. No. But you, 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 you saw it up on the slide. Yeah. So uh, as Vice Chair, I think the, I think we have to, the Chair and I are going to meet with, uh, uh, their leadership and just kind of figure out uh, what are their goals, uh, what what do they want? I think uh, to happen with with the students in the city of Wilmington. There there's been a lot of conversations, and I think we just need to share what our vision is, and they share what their vision is. So I think that's just a conversation, and I think once we have the conversation, I think then we can better uh, figure out is there an alignment? Where is the alignment? Uh, we don't. We definitely don't want to stray down the same path. I think. I don't think that would be beneficial. So I, I think it's at this point it's just a conversation to figure out what are you, what are, what is your goals? What are your goals? What are our goals? And to see how they kind of marry up. So I see the the initial meeting as just kind of like fact finding, kind of just like learning. Um, you know, we talked a lot in the slides about partnerships. Um, that's a part of a partnership. So to what degree, I think well, we have to find that out and then take it back to our council and then see what direction the council wants to go in and, and hopefully they would need to do the same thing. So there, there are actually two meetings scheduled. There's a, a meeting with just the uh, two uh, leaders from each group. And then there's a, uh, another meeting that is scheduled, I think, in the ones at the beginning of the week, ones at the end of the week. Uh, and then in that meeting, there will be more people participating, and I'm not really sure at this point what that would involve. We, we don't really know. We, what we know is that we wanted to reach out to have a conversation to figure out um, how do we coexist in a meaningful way. So I, that's okay. the best I can do. Thank you, sir. I think the other slide is question and answers. So at this point, I would answer any questions that you have that uh, 
or on the presentation or not. Okay. Are there any questions from any council members? I have one. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, earlier you mentioned the need for transformational uh, leaders. H how does a leader become transformational? Is that something that's taught? Is that something that's just innate or is it a combination? And can they be transformational without the proper resources? So a transformational leader is a leader that understands um, that first they have experience. Mm -hmm. And so there's a process called 90-90-90. Uh, if you type that up, you'll get a list of uh, criteria and schools. I have it. Um, but the 99 schools are predicated on uh, schools that had real low poverty, right, low performance, or actually high performance because they transfer into a 90-90 school. They were low academic performance, and then they increased their academic performance. Um, the, the school that's most notable to me um, from several years ago, I don't know if it's still there, is Brockton, Brockton High School in Massachusetts. Uh, their principal turned their school around. They were, they were performing at a really low clip, I mean, extremely low. They had high poverty, because those are the two components. And then the third one is she, she, they raised the scores for those students to 90 or 80. In some cases, uh, I looked at, the last time I looked at the data, they were at above 90, 98, and then they went down to like 87, and then they bounced up to 92. So you'll see some fluctuation. But the criteria is there for, for those schools. A person who has experience working in schools that have those conditions, they have uh, students who are challenged academically, students who are challenged behaviorally, students who are challenged at, uh, in attendance, uh, coming to school, mm -hmm. um, poverty, all, all those things that exist. And you can go into those schools, this person would go into those schools, and they would use teaching best practices, they would use uh, social uh, constru constructs, they would use um, engagement with community, engagement with parents, um, they would have a, mo the model would have teachers uh, co-own and, and have a voice in how the school is operated and run. Um, so it's distributive leadership, we distribute it because no one person, principal, system principals can do it by themselves. So we understand that. So this person would, would come to us who would demonstrate the skills that they've been in that environment and they produce positive outcomes. Okay. As opposed to the transactional person. The transactional person normally is a, a principal who is a good person who may have come up through the system but may not have all the skills needed to move a challenging, difficult school. Look, education is nowhere near what it used to be. And, and it's a challenge, and, and schools are expected to do everything for kids, everything. So they're the bridge between home and school. So is, can they cross the bridge every day and return better than they left in, in the school system? So the transactional person will take a student and cuddle them because they understand the difficulties where they just came from, the trauma where they just came from. But they may not hold them fully accountable. I'm gonna hold you fully accountable because the system that's in place, so there are four pillars to a, trans, a, a effective school and a, transact, a transformational leader looks at. They look at their leadership and the, lead, the ability to be more inclusive. They look at instruction. Are the instructional things that we're doing effective for the population of students we serve? They look at environment, the culture. What is the culture that's going on in here that is, that's gonna allow us to move or is gonna keep us in the same non-performance spot? And then the last thing, which is they're all equally important, is systems. The systems that we operate in our school, are they clear? Are they consistent? Are they based on things that we know have worked or will work? 
So we have to look and examine all of our systems. We have to examine the system that we use for getting kids to come to school. If we lived in Texas, Texas is funded based on the average daily attendance. So you don't come to school, we don't get your money. We pay you, and they're looking at this, they're looking at a model, I think they may even be experimenting with this year, where they look at funding in September 30th, which is traditional, mm -hmm. and then they look at it again in January or February, because we know there's a lot of mobility, but there's no, there's no correction for that in the current model. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at that. So there, there are things that are happening, so I don't want to give this doom and gloom, uh, but I'm telling you the reality. So, so that, that person that hugs kids, they're really handicapping kids. Mm -hmm. there, there's a way you hug a kid but hold them accountable too. Right. And I think that's what has to happen. One of your relatives hugged kids, but he, held, he held them accountable at Bancroft. Mm -hmm. the, the culture of the school was different than the culture of the school is today. And I can say that because I've walked through it. So I, I get upset, I get angry, I get mad when I see kids in environments that are not conducive to them growing because the situation in the city of Wilmington, which is one of the reasons why I agreed to be on this council and ran for the school board, it has to change because if we don't change the kids' ability to be able to fend for themselves, for them to be able to go out and get a decent job and have a decent life for their families. If we don't change that, crime doesn't change. The circumstances that we we're faced with, they don't change. So if we want them to change, we have to do, we have to do that. Right. And we have to hold people accountable for doing that. And all these, these things and other things uh, would play a big part in doing that. OK. All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. At this time, I would like to recognize Council Member Darby. He's present. And Councilwoman McGeer, if you have a question. Yes, um, thank you, Cal um, Committee Chair. My question, well, I have a statement and then I have a question. I'd like to say um, thank you, Mr. Patton, uh, for coming tonight and doing your presentation. It was very informative. Um, and um, thank you for representing the city of Wilmington. Uh, secondly, my question is, how do you see a, a see the light at the end of the tunnel for the Wilmington Collaborative or for our schools that service our inner city kids? Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate um, your kind words. Um, to an it, this is a difficult question to answer. H here's what I will say to you. And I, I, I got to be careful because I don't want to get hey. emotional. When I visited Bancroft recently, I sit in my car afterwards and cry. Because I think our kids deserve so much more. And I think, and I said this to the mayor, and I've been saying this for a number of years, the mayor's office, the city council, has to get more involved in the education of your kids, our kids, city kids. Because even though people may have the right heart and may feel like they're doing the right thing, I can only judge you by outcomes. Mm -hmm. And if the outcomes are not meaningfully growing for our kids to be successful, I don't know. I worked in industry for DuPont. I worked in industry for 20 years. And in those 20 years, I will tell you right now, I would have been fired if the results were what they are right now. And we can, we can make all the excuses we want. We can talk about COVID-19 and the impact ahead. It did have an impact. But we've been failing our kids before COVID-19. It didn't start with COVID-19. So at some point, some way, somehow, we, we've got to say enough is enough. Our kids are that valuable to us that if you're not doing it, then goodbye. I'm not mad at you. I, 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 I traveled across the country for 15 years doing consultant work, and I had a book that I, I used to, I had a bunch of them, I gave them out, and, and now I can't even buy them. It's called Dismiss with a Kiss by Chet Waller. Dismiss with a Kiss. It's not about dismissing people, though. It's about finding the right pathway for people. 
So this is not the right pathway. I'm not mad at you, but I'm not going to allow you to keep failing yourself and kids. And that's the message that I send to city council. That's the message that I send to the mayor. We, we've got to say to these school districts that we're going to be actively engaged and involved in the process. And here's how it starts. And if we need to do it legislatively, I don't know how you do it. I'll be honest. But yeah, I know you need to do it. Question. Because these kids deserve much better than we're giving them. And we can't keep saying our kids are bad. We can't keep saying our kids are doing this and doing that. But we don't give them any real alternative. And we don't educate them properly to get to the point to make a good decision. So I'm in, I'm in this because I'm, I hope in my life I've never been classified as a loser because I don't want to start now. So for me, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to probably piss some people off, and that's OK, to make sure that we have the best opportunity to be successful in this venture. Because I've said it, I mean it. You don't get the second chance to do this. You're not going to get a second chance if somebody's going to say, well, we're going to keep pouring bad, good money after bad results. So the results have to be substantial. The key to answering your question is, do we find the right executive director to lead this work? That, that's the key. Because if we find that person and we squabble, and someone said to me in the conversation, some people were upset we were squabbling about money. Well, money is the answer to the equation. If you're going to pay somebody $125,000, you're going to get a $125,000 person. If you're going to pay somebody $150,000 or $170,000, you're going to get people of a higher caliber. And then you can demand that they have the skill set that you need to do just what you're talking about, which is be successful at the end of the day. So I, I'm going to work as hard and as long as I can. I have another commitment. It's my grandson's. But I'm going to work to make this work and do everything I can to share what I've learned, what I know, and hope that our, uh, so I can tell you this, we have a good council. I didn't pick them, but we have a good council. And I think the folks on the council that I talk with on a regular basis are committed to making this work. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Are there any other questions from council? Any questions from the public? Well, I would just like to thank you on behalf of Wilmington City Council. Thank you for coming, Mr. Pat. And I, I echo your sentiments. I spend my day doing home visits and school visits. And, and I'm often in those same schools that you speak of as being, it's, it's disheartening. It, it, it really is. And one of my goals for asking President Congo to get on this committee was because I feel like our city needs to do much more just because we don't have a Wilmington school district doesn't mean these aren't Wilmington kids. These aren't the district's kids. These are our children, and we have to play a bigger role. And it's, it's, it's sad at times for our children, especially right now. And I know you, you as well, you and I spoke about, I mean, getting the parents, getting the calls after, after the count went in. And these kids are just being left to the wayside right now. You know, it's, it, and it's, it's sad, and it's unfortunate, and, and sometimes we don't know where to, to turn to for the parents. I think that that's where we might have to get some legal bite, or you know, council has to be more involved, definitely the city and administration. And again, I, I applaud you, and I, I thank you for what the work you're doing, and got, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I, I, I appreciate it, and as, as a father, and working, and being in the schools that you've been in, and now going in the schools that you aren't in, I, I see a difference. And if we can get that difference back in our buildings, and it's not the man, it's the mission, it's the work, it's getting the right staff, right staff in the right places. And I thank you, applaud you for your efforts and, and the council and whatever we can do, we're here to support you. Thank you, I, I appreciate it. And it's tough sometimes. Um, I will give you a update on the council's work as often as you deem necessary. So if it's a quarter or yes. whatever time is necessary, let me know. That, that was oh, my hope, sir. And I'll come you back. guys come in quarterly. If not you, then maybe maybe a representative would come in and speak maybe quarterly, give us an update. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah. And, and next up, we have uh, Councilwoman Darby has a resolution. Yes. Um, thank you, um, Chair. Um, so this specific resolution um, is about um, urging the school districts 
the Department of Health, the Delaware General Assembly to coordinate um, with the school districts and the affected schools to remove lead contamination from water sources. So back in October of 2022, um, over 22 schools had detectable lead um, levels. And there is no safe blood level um, of lead in the human body at all. And I was really concerned, one, as a parent, I have students, <laughs> young kids who are in schools, um, as a council person, as a community person, as someone that just cares on why um, there wasn't more press around this, why there wasn't more movement. Um, and we talk about, and we just had Mr. Um, Mr. Patton just talk about student outcomes, student success, um, and this is, one of the issues um, where lead is a very toxic substance. And when found in drinking water, it can cause serious health complications, cognitive and behavioral problems during development. So you have elementary kids, Wilmington students drinking lead water. You, it causes body weakness, high blood pressure, anemia, strokes, and it even can lead to, it could be um, fatal. Um, so I love that when he said, um, Mr. Patton said to that city council needs to step up and be involved in these issues. Um, and I know for me over um, the last two years, I have been trying to get more involved in understanding school boards and the importance of them and the voice that I can have as a council person. So a lot of the Red Clay school board members I have become um, professionally acquainted with in regards to how can I support? What can I do in my role or power? And I think even if I can't have a direct um, say in the budget or money, I could do resolutions to say, this is enough. We, we can't do this. We have to um, make sure that our kids have safe drinking water, that their body has isn't being impacted. And this is a long-term health complications um, that lead can have on the body. I want to thank the community that has stepped up. Um, there's a coalition um, for Lead Free Delaware. They have been doing amazing work in regards to holding these schools, holding the department accountable to how they're responding to this. And I just want to take this time to thank you guys for doing this because we need different groups of people everyone working on different issues and I'm watching and I'm seeing I can't be as involved as I want to be but I'm supporting in any way that I can and this is one way of showing my support in the work that the community that Lead Free Delaware is doing that some of our school districts are taking the lead on like um, school board member um, Jose he has been taking the lead um, in addressing this and saying this is unacceptable we have to have an action plan and it can't be um, and we can't prolong it because our kids are um, ingesting lead um, or even in some schools, they're giving them water bottles and then charging them for the water bottles. <laughs> so it, it's so many issues are problems. So um, I, I, that's the point of the resolution and that's where I stand on it. So thank you for allowing me to uh, present this resolution tonight, Chair. Thank you, Councilwoman Darling. Are there any questions from the council? I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. So noted. Uh, Councilwoman Dever, I do have a, a question. Do we know of the 22 schools, were they identified and how many of those schools were in Wilmington? Yeah, they were identified. So in, a, um, in the news article, they list all 22 schools. I can bring up the list if we want to go through it. But yes, there were... Um, some in our school districts that impact Wilmington kids, yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any questions from the public? Can I, can I just caution you? So when we talk about uh, Wilmington... Can you come to the mic? Oh, I no problem, sir. Uh, can I just caution you? When we talk about uh, Wilmington City schools, remember, our kids go out to the suburban schools too. Yes. So it's not just the schools that's here in the city, it's the schools that our kids attend to, which are mm -hmm. all the high schools. So. Good point, thank you, sir. So wherever Wilmington students go, those are Wilmington schools. 
period. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, council, Chair, I'm sorry, we have uh, uh, someone from the public. Yes, W. Whiten, is there uh, someone from the public to speak? Yes, we have somebody who wants to speak. Amy Rowe. Uh, Amy Rowe, the floor is yours. You have three minutes. Ms. Rowe, are you there? Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Amy Rowe, and I am not a Wilmington resident, although I am with Lead Free Delaware, and I am a proud alumna of Bancroft Intermediate School. And I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Councilwoman Darby for bringing this issue forward to you. Uh, your support on the uh, very concerning issue of lead in the drinking water of public schools statewide is critical because children travel in and out of the city limits to attend school. And there's uh, currently a process of resampling and reanalyzing the uh, drinking water in every consumption point in every Delaware public school. And the results of those are very alarming. There's now over 5,000 results available. And uh, some of those results are shockingly high. So the timeliness of this is spot on. And I wanted to just uh, thank you all for your support of eradicating childhood lead poisoning. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. Are there any other comments? All right. Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, we do have some. Yes, sir, please come up. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Donald Farrell, and I am a Wilmington resident, and I live in the third councilmatic district. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak to you all about this. Uh, I am a lead poisoning prevention advocate. I'm also the chair of the primary prevention uh, subcommittee of the Childhood Lead Poisoning Advisory Committee. I am glad to see that uh, Councilwoman Darby and hopefully the council and this committee is finally putting lead on their radar by sponsoring a resolution to address the issue of lead contaminated school drinking water. By sponsoring and hopefully passing a resolution by the city, this makes a bold statement that sends a clear message to the legislators in Dover that the Wilmington uh, Council and the city also support safe clean drinking water uh, free of lead contaminations. Also, I'd like to add that the children and students are not the only victims of lead exposure. In our community, we have an excess rate of high blood pressure, which isn't all due to salt, but chronic lead exposure causes hypertension. This is not a Democrat a Republican issue, or black, brown, or white, but it transcends all of the differences we may have. Hopefully, you can agree that safe, clean drinking water for our students and the babies, who are the most vulnerable segment of our population, is urgent. Hopefully, Wilmington City Council can create a comprehensive set of resolutions to address the drinking water and the other lead-related issues that impact our students and babies, such as reducing the, lead ex the exposure of lead dust by having Dendrec include dust testing in their weatherization program, which they manage. Other, and the other issue is opposing the Department of Justice's reclassification of school nurses from practitioners to administrators, thusly denying them access to school-led test data, thereby preventing the school nurse 
from the ability to refer students to um, special programs to deal with the effect of lead exposure and to help them overcome any learning and intellectual defects. Lastly, home-based daycares, while not considered a school, must also be addressed by testing the water and providing any remedial measures to reduce and eliminate lead exposure. I appreciate Councilwoman Darby for having the courage to bring this to your attention, and hopefully when it goes before council, it'll be passed. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, sir. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Good night. Thank you. Good night.